Hi, my name's Wink Lorch. I'm a wine writer from the UK. I'm here in Los Angeles to present a seminar on Savoir Wines, uh, which is inspired by my latest book, Wines of the French Alps. Uh, the seminar is supported by the Wine Education Council and the Veritas Fund, and I'm looking forward to sharing all my inside secrets. Uh, we have with us Wink Lorch. Uh, who, has, uh, who actually studied Savoir wines probably about the same time that I was drinking piches of Jacquere along with raclette down in Val d'Isere. <laughs> but she's been doing it and is probably okay. and is now yeah, I think I'm hoping to be, not uh, to use it, but uh, we'll the leading see. Thanks. expert in the Savoir. Not that that is a title that many people have sought. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Not a lot of competition there, Wayne. No. Got to admit. Okay. No. All right. Uh, it's growing. But, <laughs> but Wink is, as you may know, a, a, a British uh, author and a writer and educator. And she, uh, she has a miserable existence, splitting her life between London and the Alps. But somehow she has found some time to come and speak to us today. So join me in welcoming Wink Lurch. Uh, thank you, John, and I hope you'll indulge me. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Good morning, Los Angeles. <laughs> so, um, if any of you thought that you were coming to a Jura seminar, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Jura and Savoir have long been grouped together and there are people still in the wine trade in the US and in the UK and even in France who think the two are the same and that they're just sort of like these little tiny regions that don't really matter much and are over in eastern France and hey they're mountain wines at high altitude and odd grapes that's it. Now seriously they were grouped together for a long time simply for editorial convenience in that they were and they remain tiny tiny regions. The two together represent under one half of a percent of French wine production. That's how tiny they are. And if you imagine, if any of you have ever um, worked in publishing and you're sort of trying to do space and work things out, and you don't want to give much space to these regions, and hey, you can do a map and you can link them together because you can put Geneva there and you can put Jura to the north and Savoie to the south. Bingo, done, end of story. So everybody just mixed them up all together because nobody really cared about them anyway. Um, so things changed at the beginning of this century when in particular Jura wines started to sort of leave their homeland, mainly sourced by US importers who realized there was something interesting going on. I happened to be part living in the French Alps at the time, part living. I knew Savoir better. In fact, I didn't know Jura wine at all. I really didn't. And thanks to a uh, couple of people, one who uh, edited an encyclopedia and asked me to write on Jura and Savoir. What? I know nothing, but no, nor did anyone else. And then a couple of years later, Tom Stevenson, the British wine author, uh, he came up with this great idea for a new uh, annual guide, which is just a tragedy that it doesn't exist anymore. It came out between 2004 and 2009, um, and it was just called Tom Stevenson's Pocket Wine Guide or something, and it wasn't Pocket. And it had 40 contributors, and yours truly wrote on Jura and Savoir. Well, I didn't want to do it, but he said, come on, Wink, you know, we need somebody doing this. I said, but I know nothing about the Jura. Yeah, but nor does anybody. And you will be able to make your name and fame from Jura wines. And by the way, Tom hated, hated Van Joan, an oxidative wine. And so he, um, you know, that, that's sort of no secret. He would tell you that himself, and he still does. So um, that's how it all started. And gradually, because the Jura wine sort of took on a life of its own in export markets, I had to sort of keep Savoir wines over there and just what I would drink when I was in the mountains. And uh, 
I eventually was sort of almost forced to write a book on Jura wine. Um, I had to self-publish it. No publisher would have picked it up. And uh, it all went very well, but I always meant to write a book on Savoir wine. So here we are. What uh, we have now is the blue book, having had the yellow book. And if you don't already have a copy of the blue book, today's your chance. Um, but before that, I'm going to focus a little bit about on Savoir, but also explain why Savoir is not the only wine from the French Alps. Um, so we have a little bit of a problem. Those of you who have, uh, who are Somme's in restaurants with big wine lists, and you might have some Savoir wines on there, often you see a heading that says Savoir wine. And there are three, four, five, six, seven wines, whatever it is. And in the middle, there's Franck, Peyo, Altesse, Roussette du Bouget. Huh? That's not Savoir. And then a little bit further down in the reds, there's Nicolas Gonin, uh, IGP, Isère, Persson. Uh, that's not Savoir. But they fall under the Savoir heading. But they don't in reality. So whereas it would have been really nice for me to just follow on my book very simply called Jura Wine with another book called Savoir Wine, I didn't think it was fair on Bouget and on Isère and that they need absolutely separate treatment, albeit they are much smaller than Savoir. And there are lots of overlaps and that's where it comes complicated. There were also, I also sort of fell for a little region, tiny region, further south, way high up, higher altitude than any of the others, uh, called Oats Alp where they have a, a really obscure grape called Mollard. And this really obscure grape Mollard reminded me a little bit of Mondeuse, but different. And I thought, oh my goodness, well, Mollard and high altitude, I have to include it. And if I included that, I have to include uh, the Dioir, where Clairette de D comes from, because that's in the foothills of the French Alps as well. And then I stopped and I said, I'm not going further south to Nice, as some people told me I needed to, because the Alps end in Nice, because as you go further south, it becomes more and more Provençal. And that, that you know, no, no, I'm stopping there. So what these wines all have in common is the vineyards are all on the foothills of either the Jura or more often than not the pre-Alps. So the pre-Alps are the lower mountains that lead up to the Alps. And unlike the Alps, they are fundamentally limestone. Obviously, the soils are more complicated than that, and I'm going to touch on them for Savoir and touch on the geology, but um, fundamentally limestone soils, which it shares with the Jura Mountains, but not the Jura wine region. So limestone, lots of diversity. And generally, whereas people think it's a freezing cold climate, we're in the mountains, there are really balmy, warm summers mitigated by lakes nearby and some of the vineyard slopes are facing south. They get very, very hot indeed. There are almond trees, there are uh, almonds, walnuts, uh, peaches. You know, this isn't cold, cold climate. This isn't the, the champagne climate or anything like that. So the mountains, however, do have a, a dramatic influence on the weather. So they, they direct the weather, they can bring storms uh, and so on. But for many historical reasons, there is an incredible diversity of grape varieties. And that's another thing that they have in common. And to me, whereas when I wrote the, the Jura book, it was yellow for the obvious reason of Vin Jaune. And uh, the absolute USP of that book was the really obscure ways of making wines. If there is a real important common thread with, with wines of the French Alps, it's the obscure grape varieties and what delightful flavors they can give us. Um, and that's the excitement in these wines. And what are the wines like? Well, freshness and lightness. And you're going to find later, I'm going to say it now because I'm going to forget. You're going to find later it's going to be really frustrating because I don't stand here and say this wine tastes like that. You have to say that. I don't do that. You're the professionals out there who taste wines. I'm going to give you the background around it and then together we work out what they're like. That's, that's, that's how I work. So. Um, uh, just in case you're lost geographically, you do have a map in your 
a uh, little booklet, but that is specifically Savoie and Bouget. This is just a, a broader, um, a la smaller scale map to situate everywhere. So here's Macon. So this is the Maconnais and the Beaujolais. Further south is uh, the Northern Rhone Valley, so Lyon, and then from Vienne down to Valence, the Northern Rhone Valley. Uh, talking of other regions, we would have uh, here's Switzerland, so Alsace is just off the top of the map there. Here is Jura coming down here. And all these sort of islands of vineyards here are the Savoie, and these islands here are Bouget, and then my little other areas, uh, Isère and Diawa and haute Salpe are here. The main part of Savoie is this part here around Chambéry. And also note the rivers, so the Rhone River you might think that the Rhone River is just, you know, Rhone Valley wines. Oh, no, it's not. It starts in Switzerland. It starts over here. Whoops. Try not to knock this over. Whoops. I think we're okay. The Rhone Valley uh, vineyards start over here with the Swiss vineyards of the valley. The Rhone River then disappears into Lac Le Mans or Lac Gene Lake Geneva, if you prefer, comes out at Geneva comes down, passes through Cessel, which is where the sparkling wine you've just had came from, passes through Cessel, down here it divides Savoie and Bouget here, and uh, so you can see there are vineyards in Savoie that are overlooking the Rhone Valley, then it heads off around southern Bouget and over to Lyon and down through what most people think of as Rhone Valley wines. Um, and uh, one of my favorite lines in my own book is when I wrote, all rivers lead to Rome. No. <laughs> because um, there are many, many um, tributaries, most importantly the Isère that comes from just above Val d'Isère, John's favorite ski resort, um, and uh, actually passes below the, the main vineyards of Savoie. So that's just put things in perspective for you. Is this okay now that it's twisted? You can still see it? Good. Um, how do I do a potted history? Well, you know about history of wines in France, or maybe you don't. There were vineyards pre-Roman here, and I think the most important thing to say is that the peoples who lived between Geneva and Lyon were called the Alabroge. And the Alabroge have given their name to two things that we still talk about today. One is of a great variety that Pliny the Elder talked about and uh, in Roman times as being this fabulous grape that made the best red wines and it was known as Vitis Alabrogica um, and from the Alabroge. And although obviously we can't reproduce what that grape is today, historians and ampelographers are pretty sure that it was a precursor of Mondeaux. So that is pretty interesting. And the other thing the Alabroge have given their name to is the IGP, or previously Van de Pey from the region. Because the Savoir AOC was created fairly late in 1973, um, the Savoyards are, I mean, nearly all the French are protectionists, but boy, the Savoyards are super protectionist. They won't even allow their flag to be used on anything other than Savoy AOC wines, not the AG, IGPs, not the Van de France, nothing. They'll sue. And so when the Van de Pey came along, which replaced by the IGP, they had to find a different name that didn't include Savoy. So today we have two wines that are IGP, Vin des Alabroges. And so that's to say that about history. Then we can skip the Romans. They did great things. What did they ever do for us? All that. Um, and we get on to the church now. Church were very important, of course, as they were in so many other places. Uh, the point here to note is that Savoie, if you think back to the map, I'm not going to return to it. Savoie is very much a crossroads. The Alps have been a crossroads forever. And travel was very, very, very difficult. Uh, and so people needed places to rest, and they tended to rest in monasteries where the monks and would put them up, and they obviously needed to 
give hospitality and it was the church's aim to provide good hospitality meaning good wine and food so therefore they needed wine so therefore they needed to nurture good vineyards and so on so the church was super important in making the the first wines now unlike somewhere like Jura where a little bit was exported to exported we'll call it that exported to Paris and sent up to the courts and and had a reputation like that there was none of that in Savoie. The only reputation that they had was as a wine for travelers. And that, okay, when you went through the area, you could get something decent to drink. Um, and that was it, it never left those areas. The other thing that I must point out is that Savoie wasn't France. Savoie was Savoie, or the House of Savoy, or the Duchy of Savoy, or Savoie which was linked with, at one point, Chambéry was the capital, and then Turin became the capital. So it's linked with northwest Italy, um, because Italy wasn't a country. OK, we won't go any further with all this. Um, but Savoie did not become France until 1860. So that has also had an influence on things. So once the church sort of uh, had less of an importance, the peasants sort of rose up and ruined everything. So the wine got sort of not as good as it was and so on. And then uh, industrial revolution and trains arrived bringing cheap wine from the south of France. Not just cheap wine, more alcoholic, redder, and so why on earth would you bother with Savoir wines? So Savoir wines really nearly died a death. So you had that, the economic side of it. You obviously had all the vine diseases that everywhere had, the mildews and the phylloxera. And then in the, once we're in the 20th century, the two world wars took all the young men. And so the women who were left behind found it very difficult to work what were very, very steep slopes that had not been managed in a way they are now with, with little proper paths and so on to work them. And honestly, these vines would have disappeared if it hadn't been for the ski industry. So the ski industry really was one of two things that saved the Savoie wine region. The ski industry and the rise of it, which really started in the late 50s and 60s in France and really took off by the end of the 60s and the 70s, um, was hugely important to give a market. And French people, when they travel, tend to want to have the local wines and the local foods and to support them. So therefore, um, Savoir sort of wine producers such as that were there, and they were mainly cooperatives, um, they said, well, you know, we, we can sell wine here. The other saviour will perhaps shock you more than this. Uh, the other saviour was the arrival of chemicals. So chemical farming effectively saved the vineyards of Savoie. We're talking of very difficult slopes. And if you've got some chemicals to ease the way, very rainy, so therefore lots of weeds, if you can use chemical herbicide, rather than having to go and manually do this backbreaking work, that's a saviour. Of course, you had years before the chemical era when the crop was just wiped out by, by mildews or by rot or whatever. Again, the sprays saved the day. Now, obviously, today, for all the reasons I'm sure you know, we're going the other way, and we have the ability to go that other way. But at the time, and all the vine if you talk to any family of vine families of vignerons, anybody over about 70 years old today will say to you, chemicals saved our vineyards. That's why we've got them. So it, it's just something to bear in mind. Um, so that's a potted history and modern history we're going to discover as we, as we look at the wines today. Um, just putting everything into perspective, I already indicated that Savoir was small. Uh, I didn't say so earlier, but I think you've gathered we're just focusing solely on Savoir today and not the other four regions in my book. So, very small, 0.3% of French total vineyards, which just for the record is about half of Chablis, and just for the record is about how much Pinot Noir is planted in Santa Barbara. Just looked that up and thought, yeah, it's quite nice. Um, 17 million bottles a year, it's not very much. Um, I mean, I don't know, how much does LA drink? 
It's a few more than 17 million, I imagine. Um, and 17 million is, of course, an average. We've had very up and down vintages in the last decade um, because of hail storm, hail storms, frost, uh, disease pressure even today, or a drought even, and two hot, hot summers. All sorts of things have meant, meant that production has dipped in some years. Um, and it's not likely to increase because uh, the way France plantings work, it's, it's really not going to increase anytime soon. Um, just over two thirds is white, and then 21% red, tiny bit of rose, and a growing segment, but only growing very slowly, is the sparkling segment because they have the Cremant de Savoie Appellation as well as Cécile and Aïse. Um, exports, oh, this is fun. How do I get a figure for exports? The Savoie wine body do not give me any figures because they don't know themselves and because the producers don't give them the information. So I don't know. Is it 5%? Is it 7%? Might it be a bit more? It's hard to tell because like every wine region in the world, Savoir is dominated by bigger companies, by negotiations, by, co by cooperatives, and actually, uh, all, most, not all of them, but most of the big companies export very, very little. We're talking about 2 or 3%. So it's the smaller producers and the organic producers who you will find, you know, when you talk to them, they go, oh, hey, we export 60%. So, so, but they've only got, say, 7 hectares. So. It's, it's very, very hard to get those figures. It is, I'm fairly confident, going up. But how quickly it will, will go up, I don't know. Interestingly, something I didn't say yesterday, but when I first started working with Jura, it was 2% that was exported, and now it's 20%. I'm not saying that that's because of my book. My book had one tiny uh, impact on that, yes, um, but it was a whole movement. Now, whether we'll get Savoir up to 20% in the next 10 years? Don't know. We'll have to see. I'm not sure. Maybe. Could do. Um, so, a little bit about the geography. 45 degrees latitude. Some of you might be aware that this is a sort of magic latitude. It runs through uh, Bordeaux. It runs through uh, the Northern Rhone. And it runs through Savoir in the Northern Hemisphere. It runs through uh, sorry, not in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Americas, it runs through Niagara. So I just put that there. Altitude. Please, if you have very, no offence, lazily sold Savoir wines by just saying, oh, they're high altitude mountain wines, just let me throw this out to you. The altitude, 250 to 500 meters, I put it in feet there. Most of the vineyards are between 300 and 400 meters. That is more or less the same as Alsace. Um, the higher vineyards of Burgundy, the Haute Côte de Beaune and the Haute Côte de Nuit are around 350. What makes Savoie such high altitude? It really isn't. They are, however, on very, very steep slopes. And as I said earlier, there, are, there is a big influence from the high mountains. And you can see them. You can see the snow-capped mountains. And you can see the weather moving when you live and you travel in the mountains. And that brings these uh, very complicated weather patterns. Believe it or not, there's an influence from far to the west of the Atlantic, even though it's several hundred miles away. It actually, the weather is driven from the west, so that can dri bring in driving rains as well. And then the complicated mountain system means that it can too often fall as hail. And climate change seems to be bringing these complicated weather systems even more. Um, climate change is a double-edged sword for, for Savoie. It's brought much greater ripeness, uh, much more chance of, of, of being able to ripen your grapes and not have to enrich, apart from a couple of uh, grape varieties where you nearly always do. I'll mention them later. Um, it's bought a more regular, in one way, more regular crops. But on the other hand, you know, who would ever have imagined it being too hot in these areas and, to, and drought and these uh, increasing frequency of violent storms, much more violent than before. So, and the other problem is frost, frost spring frost, 
Um, and that is worse than before it always happened, but it's worse because the vines spring into life, it seems, much, much earlier. You know, budding at the end of February or early March, and they're starting to do really well, and then bang, in sort of third week of April, you suddenly have a dip in temperature and ruined by frost. So it's a scary, scary time. So it is this double-edged sword. There are definitely advantages too. Um, there are some uh, day-night temperature differences uh, with increasing altitude, especially on, uh, in the height of the summer months where it can get very hot and it still does nearly always cool down significantly at night and especially in the higher vineyards. Um, and the exposures are, are very varied indeed. Oh, let's have the geology lesson. <gasps> Gosh, I get scared of geology and soils. I had a dilemma for the book. I read other books, you know, you read other ones on Savoy in, in, in French, and you've got a choice. Either you go, the soils are limestone, full stop. And the grape varieties, and uh, either you do that, or you go to pages and pages and pages of numerous diagrams like this. It's incredibly varied because in a way it's a moving soil. It wa was a moving soil because the glaciers brought different soil from everywhere else. So all the rivers, notably the Isère here, were formerly glaciers. Glaciers, sorry, just in case you can't understand what I'm saying. And uh, so they would actually they brought all these different soils. So the Cretaceous limestone and the Jurassic limestone come from the pre-alps that are like cliffs behind the vineyards. So the Bauge are one of the pre-alpine ranges, the Chartreuse are one of the pre-alpine ranges, and yes, I know lots of you love that vile green liquid. It comes from way south of here near Grenoble, um, which uh, is, is part of the Chartreuse Mountains as well. This is the north of the Chartreuse. Okay, I am so mean. I know it's very, very <laughs> sacred here. Um, the Beldon are, the, are part of the actual Alps rather than the pre-Alps. So when you're standing in a vineyard over here, you'll have uh, a cliff behind you, a limestone cliff, and ahead of you, you'll have this amazing view of snow-capped mountains. Unfortunately, in the valley, because this is a wealthy area and very industrialized, you'll see a valley full of factories. Um, it's actually it, quite challenging for photographers. So, so <laughs> those two were um, fixed soils, if you like, from the mountains, whereas these have all moved there. Now, scree uh, has come down, that's the sort of stony stuff, the limestone scree has come down from the mountains, whereas alluvial cones have been formed by this moving, moving frozen water, uh, glacial till and mixed alluvial soils, all those are moving. Now, of course, this means you can grow a variety of different grape varieties. Some soils are warmer than others, some drain water better than others, etc., etc. There is one particular um, geological feature that, that you can't really learn about Savoir without learning about it. Um, it features on the front of my book, it's Mont Granier, which is a very distinctive mountain. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. Mont Granier is roughly over here. And um, uh, what happened to Mont Granier created a very different soil type over here. So there is Mont Granier, and you see that great big rock there in the foreground. This, along with other smaller, massive boulders, all came down off the top of that mountain in 1248. Um, a disastrous uh, rock fall followed by landslide. The rock fall created then a further landslide, burying five villages. There, were, there was more habitation on the hillsides there at that time than there was in what we now know as the city of Chambéry. They lived above the river, uh, and that was all marshes in those days before it was dammed. They lived above, and they you know, would have been subsistence farmers, of course, and they farmed there, and they all lost their lives, everything, nothing, nothing ever lived. And the, the original books I read said 5,000 people lost their life, and then a lot of historians said, hmm, I don't think 5,000 people could have been living there at that time, but 1,000, which was huge at the time, is, is more likely. So what did this do for vineyards? Well, 
for the next couple of centuries, nothing happened there. Nothing grew or anything. And then they realized that actually, if they did some work, they could plant vines there. And originally, they would have planted red grape varieties because that's what everybody wanted to drink red wine. But then eventually, they realized that Jacquer, that was indigenous to the region and growing here and there, would actually ripen better and more consistently and give volume. And volume was what everybody used to look for. And that is what mainly grows there today, because some of the slopes are actually north-facing there, some are not, it's varied, and Jacquet actually ripens. So these will be the vineyards of Abim and Apremont, which are the most planted uh, vineyard areas in Savoie. Now, the Jacquet grape, um, I can't overestimate its importance um, in the region. It, it, uh, for these percentages are percentages of the total plantings, not just the white wine grapes. Um, so 42% and it used to be 50%, so that's come down. The reason it's come down is that nobody is planting it anymore, really. Um, and the good thing about that is that we're getting an older, older, an older average vine age. So that's really quite exciting because if you handle Jacquer right, it is very much a wine for today, I think. And I, I think it's going to grow in importance, but not probably be planted anymore. Altesse, however, is um, arguably the finest white grape variety of Savoie. It is indigenous to there, as is Jacquer. They now know this. If you have read any stories about it coming from Cyprus, it is a story. If you go and visit uh, wine producers and they tell you this with a straight face, they actually believe it. It is wrong. Ampelographers and uh, grape scientists will tell you it is wrong. It is now proven by DNA testing that it is indigenous to the Lake Geneva, this part of the Rhone area. So um, they can't tell exactly. It's also not ferment. At one point, they thought it was ferment from Hungary, which would have a link with Cyprus, blah, blah, blah. It's all written about in my book. Um, it's a wonderful grape variety that um, can express um, different terroirs extremely well, and we're going to be trying two very contrasting Altesse wines. It also has supreme ageability when handled right, and that's why I think it's so important. Roussan um, is important in one tiny area of Savoie in Chignan, where um, it has its own uh, mini appellation, its own sub appellation, if you like. Um, Chardonnay was planted like it was everywhere. These days, it's really not very important in Savoie, except for sparkling wines, where it can be it's used as part of the blend. Chasla is only uh, grown in one part of Savoie, in the northern part that's close to Switzerland. And just a few words about Granger. How many in this audience, don't be shy, are sort of confirmed fans of Domaine Belois? Okay, three, four of you. Um, if you haven't heard of D Domaine Belois, don't worry. Uh, far too expensive on allocation, and it's not um, Dominique Belois's fault at all, it's just happened. Um, uh, Domaine Belois is in the little uh, crew or um, specific area of Aïs, makes sparkling and still white wines from a grape called Granger. I have spoken to lots of people who put Granger as a significant grape of Savoie. Well, it isn't. It's, an, it, it's, some, it's only in IEs, so it's only in this one place, and there's actually less than 1% there. So there are a few other white grape varieties, notably Mondeuse Blanche, which is not related. It is related, but it's not a white version of Mondeuse Noir. It's just a separate grape variety. With reds, you might be surprised to see Gamay at the top of the list. Um, Gamay was planted. Um, a lot in the 60s and 70s, like Jacquer was planted then with the revival of the vineyards for the ski industry, because it was an easy grape to grow and easy to produce volume. Today it's not being replanted, but once again we've got increasing vine age, so there can be some interesting gamets because of that. The exciting grape is Mondeuse Noir, which has gradually been increasing in quantity. Um, Mondeuse, uh, is not, again, if you have old wine books, 
Just put them somewhere for posterity, but don't believe what is written in there. Some of the old wine books will tell you Mondeuse is the same as Rafosco of Italy. That was disproved 20 years ago. It's not. It is now known to be part of the Syrah family. So earlier on, I mentioned that Mondeuse Blanche is a separate variety. It is the mother of Syrah. That was found out by an eminent professor, Carol Meredith, uh, better known today as uh, running with her husband Steve, a lovely little bijou winery in the Napa Valley in Mount Vida called Lagier Meredith. Um, she was a professor at Davis and she actually, uh, an ampelographer, and her team discovered the family of Syrah, and in which Mondeuse appears. But Mondeuse is a um, Again, a lot of people just are a little bit lazy, but this isn't too bad. They say it's a cousin of Syrah. It's an easy way to explain it, but it's not. It's either a grandparent or a grandchild. They don't know which because they've got some gaps in the family tree. Um, but it's interesting to know that because its properties are very different to Syrah in some ways, but it shares certain things. Pinot Noir has been, is planted in a few areas used for both red and sparkling. And then there is the exciting grape Persan, which used to be planted um, in uh, almost equal quantities to Mondeuse. Even in the 1950s, there were five or 600 hectares of it. Um, but it declined, A, because it's a very difficult grape in terms of disease pressure, but B, because the valley where it was mainly uh, grown was uh, completely industrialized and uh, these days only has like two hectares of vineyards um, and is not part of the Appalachian. Persson was then allowed back into the Appalachian, thank goodness, and now is being replanted, but there's still less than, less than 25 hectares of it. Um, and I sadly couldn't get any for you for, for these seminars because what little there is in, in the US is, is, is hard to get hold of. Um, oh dear, I have to hurry with this. I suggest that you have open in your booklets page four and five where the... Um, where the map is that shows all the different Savoir crews and also the Bouget ones, but we won't go through the Bouget ones. So uh, the general Appellation is Vin de Savoir with red, white, or rosé. It is these days more often simply Savoir, which is great news. There are 16 extra crews attached to it, which I'm going to go through in a minute. And the reason I've put rosé method traditionnel there as well is because Cremant de Savoir is a fairly new appellation and so far is only allowed for white. A white Cremant de Savoir has to be minimum 60% of local varieties, i.e. Jacquer and Altesse. This is to stop you having 100% Chardonnay under the appellation. You can have Chardonnay for the other 40% or Pinot Noir or whatever. You can also have 100% Jacquer, but you have to have at least 40% Jacquer. Uh, Roussette de Savoie is a specific Appalachian covering, again, the whole area, as does Cremant. Um, again, throw away your old wine books. Um, it is 100% Altesse. It didn't used to be. Um, and sometimes Roussette is considered a synonym of Altesse. Complicated. Four crews, which are Frangy, Maratel, those are the two biggest ones, and two small ones, Montu and Montermino. Cessel, we had a Cessel, we had a sparkling Cessel, which is a historic wine. Royal Cessel um, was a brand created in the beginning of the 20th century by Varichon Eclair, a name you will still find that is a brand name owned by Boisset that has nothing to do with Savoir wine whatsoever anymore. Um, Boisset at one point owned Varichon Eclair and they owned the Royal, uh, sorry, Boisset still owns Varichon Eclair and at one point they were in Cessel and owned uh, all of that. They let go the Royal Cessel brand, they also let go all the growers that were delivering grapes to them, and they were rescued by a guy called Gerard Lambert, who was from Cessel and already had a wine business and whose father sold grapes to Royal Cessel. 
and so uh, he rescued it and that's what you've been drinking um, it was a 2013 it probably had about three years sur lat on lees um, and is made from 60-70% Mollet and the rest Altes. Mollet is a, an unusual white grape variety that I didn't put on that list and it's even less than 1% of the plantings um, and it is very good for sparkling wine. Um, so is Altes. There's also some still Cézelle, less interesting sadly at the moment. Van des Alabroges, white red rosé, all sorts of different things. Ooh, the cruise. <laughs> You've got your map? starting sort of from the north. The first four are the ones where you have Chasselas. Then we have Aïs that I've talked about. It's a minuscule area, so that's just to the south. Those uh, first five crews are all in uh, Haute-Savoie. Uh, then you go slightly southwest above the Rhone River, and you have too much warmer areas because of the influence of the Rhone and you are further away from the high Alps. You're actually in the southern Jura in, in Chautin and jean -Gieu. Now there's, there's a tip. If you see a white wine with Appellation Contrôlé and the name of a crew and you can't remember all these crews, with the, with the noble exception of those ones at the top, all the rest, if you just see it and there's no grape on it, it'll be Jacquet. So Jacquere is the ubiquitous um, a grape variety. It's in particularly important for Apremont Ab and Abim and for Chignan. But beware, Chignan could be Chignan Bergeron. And Chignan Bergeron is the specific crew for the wines made from Roussin. And uh, if you make Roussin uh, anywhere else in the region, it has to be IGP. It can only be Appellation in that Chignan area. And then you have reds that can be made in, uh, up there. They will have to be simply Vin de Savoie or Savoie if you've got reds from those three main varieties, Mondeuse, Pinot or Gamay. Persan is always simply Vin de Savoie or Savoie. Um, and then, but you can have a Chignan Mondeuse, you can have a Chautin Gamay, etc. And finally, down here, I've got two specific crews for Mondeuse which are in much warmer areas than the rest with, with incredible, well they're warmer as in warm soils and incredibly um, well exposed uh, sites, Arbin and Saint-Jean-de-la-Porte and later we're going to be trying two contrasting Mondeuse from Arbin. Are you keeping up? We're nearly at the tasting. If you have um, a Roussin from Montmélian, does it fall under the Chinon uh, Oh, you do ask difficult questions. <laughs> the question was if you have a, a, um, a, a, a Mondeuse, no, a Roussin from Montmélian. Well, I suspect that you work with um, uh, the agents or importers of André and Michel Kenard, or you handle those wines or one of those. Marmelia is right next to Chignan and there are parts of Marmelia that are allowed to call their wine Chignan Bergeron and there are parts of Marmelia which are allowed to call their red Mondeuse Arbin because Marmelia is a town in between Arbin and Chignan. Good question. Thank God I know the, I don't know anyone else that would have known the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're almost ready to wrap up and um, the wines are going to be poured soon. Um, I'm going to keep on talking, so be aware that people are going to come behind you and we're just going to keep going with the first four wines. I want to talk a little bit about viticulture because a lot of it is about steep slopes and about the question of whether you can go organic or not in the vineyards. So, you know, obviously a burning question. Um, Roundup, its equivalent in France, is, is due to be banned. The big problem is weed killing um, because weeds are very prevalent because there's a lot of rain and so on. So how do you handle this on steep slopes and what can you do to go organic or not? Just to put this in perspective, because I haven't put this on the slide, currently it's estimated about 10% of the vineyards in Savoie are organic, which is the average in France. But by the way, the Jura is now up at 20%, and that's also very wet. So it's an interesting comparison. Um, the problems of steep slopes are erosion. 
So you can plant grass um, or let the grass grow, but then you've got to maintain it and mow it and all the rest, and that will help with the, with the erosion. You do not see many bare slopes anymore, but where you do, it is because it's too difficult, too stony to, pour, to plant the, the grasses and to maintain. So there, the easy thing to do would be to use blanket herbicide, but obviously if you do that, you can't be organic. So what can you do? You can do manual weed pull pulling. Effectively, you can use an ancient old um, uh, plow attached to a pulley system that you bring up with a tractor. You can also use a weed whacker. I love that term. We don't use that in English English. We call it a strimmer. If you ever ask anyone for a weed whacker in a garden centre in the UK, they'll look at you very strangely. And I only learnt that word this year. I'm so excited to know the word weed whacker. Um, so uh, in French, just in case you want to know, and I know there's a couple of French people here, it's a débroussailleuse, I think, um, which is really hard. I had to get one for my garden. so. It's a very difficult word. Um, that aside, it helps with manual work, but boy, is it tough. We then have the problem of fungal disease, which is prevalent. Um, some producers choose not to go organic because they believe to avoid too much copper use from use of Bordeaux mixture and copper and sulfur, that they should start the season with a systemic spray, systemic chemical spray, then move on to copper and sulfur. On the other hand, the organic faction and the biodynamic faction obviously will not do that. There are lots of things that are being experimented with apart, uh, to use in addition to copper and sulfur, which are actually um, helping to reduce the copper use. I know people who manage that, and they manage it either by what they use or by the, the labor, and labor is very expensive in France, um, to actually train the vines so that they are less susceptible, so they have lots of aeration, less susceptible for disease. It's a great challenge. I put that little picture up there because actually it shows the training here, which is single stake training, which you only see in very steep slopes, um, but is an interesting training called Sio Eshla, and uh, it is used particularly for Mondeurs and in some places in Chignan for Bergeron or Roussan, and in some places for Altes, but always on very, very steep slopes where vines on wires would be, would be difficult to handle. Yeah? How high does that grow? How high? Yes. In altitude? No, not the altitude, actually, on the stake. Oh, on the stake? Um, the stake itself is probably my height. No, a bit less. Yeah. So one meter fifty something like that, uh, whatever that is, five feet at most, um, something like that, yeah. Um, okay, the wines are being poured, one of which I thought I'd give you a cute animal picture. <laughs> and please note that I particularly put a blue halter on the donkey. Actually, somebody pointed that out the other day. I had no idea. I hadn't even looked at the picture and noticed that there was a blue halter to match my book, and I'm so <laughs> very, very happy about that. This is a gorgeous picture of Domaine des Ardoisières and our wine number three in the tasting, which is going to be the wine poured out of Magnum, um, is Domaine des Ardoisières. Now, you'll have noted that this educator in front of you has gone through all the nitty gritty of climate and soil. I am a failed master of wine, by the way, and I used to teach at Diploma. I'm very proud of being a failure, but that's why I sort of know some of this stuff. Um, so. Um, I had a bit of a problem yesterday. I had some real problem people in the audience who asked me really hard questions about winemaking and stuff. So I'm going to get this really clear right now. I haven't got tech sheets on these wines. Nearly all the tech sheets, well, I have one. There's one wine where I have a sort of what I consider to be an accurate tech sheet. Um, and I know that there is the, a couple of people who distribute that wine in the audience, or at least one. Um, it is actually from Domaine Corte. It's the only one that I trust. Um, and uh, they even, you can even download from their website the analysis from the lab that does the analysis just but bottling. So, but uh, most of the other tech sheets that if you, if you find them, um, they will just be general. They won't even be of a particular vintage. So, 
they don't mean much because obviously every vintage they change and then I would, I would visit these producers and I'd know what they did two years ago when I last visited them. So I'd just go, let me check. So you do malolactic on this wine and, and you're, you're using cultured yeast or whatever. No, 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 no. Now we use indigenous yeast. Now we're doing hardly any, you know. And, and actually, the best producers, it's good that they change every year. It's good that they adapt and they look at it. But this is why... I'm not going to be giving you all these figures. I'm going to be giving you what I can and what I think is right about each of them. There are, it's impossible to generalize with um, winemaking. Uh, all I can tell you is there's lots of um, uh, neutral, uh, believe it or not, plastic and fiberglass tanks around which are cheap and cheerful and have been around for the 50s and 60s. Obviously, the big companies and the bigger wine, the bigger, even the bigger vignerons have got stainless steel. And then at the other end of the scale, you've got organic guys who are, who are experimenting and even have used for several years concrete eggs and some who are playing with amphora and so on. Um, some use indigenous yeast, some don't. Some start with a starter culture, some don't. Um, some uh, press whole bunch, some don't. There aren't rules. It's a very disparate area. There's lots of different great varieties. Um, it's challenging and the good winemakers will adapt according to their finances and what they've got. Something I forgot to say, really, really important, really, really in the history, which leads on to the tasting as well. One of the problems, why these wines were so awful when John went to Val d'Isere, I'm so sorry on behalf of the whole of Savoie that you had such a bad experience, but they really were average at best, and most of them were substandard, except for two or three producers that you didn't find because they're on, they only sort of crept into some very expensive restaurants that you couldn't afford and, and uh, those days and so on. So um, this uh, is to say that the wines were bottled to be ready for the ski season. So they were harvested in late September, October and bottled in December and delivered. And so they were vinified. They had, had a consultant enologist that would tell them how to make the wines to do this. So, you know, it's not surprising they didn't taste them much. And that is gradually changing, not for everybody, but there's still a hell of a lot. I, I think I put a percentage, something like 70 or 80 percent of wine would be bottled by May or something following the, the harvest. So, uh, yet, varieties like Altesse in particular, and obviously the Reds, Will benefit from much, much longer. So, you know, this is work in progress. Um, so, I, must, I don't want you to be distracted by the donkeys and this gorgeous picture. I want to thank Mick Rock, who's my chief photographer, for taking this and all the other photographers. If you have been taking any photographs and if you do see this video later, do not steal these pictures, please. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> you can buy my book later. <laughs> Okay, we have, uh, I need a gulp of water. Let me breathe a minute. <sighs> we have four white wines in front of us. I'm trying to remember what they are. We have to start with Apremont. Apremont is the largest cru or geographic denomination. Uh, Jacquer has to be 80%, nearly everybody makes it 100% apart from, as usual, the negociants who, who sort of throw in a bit of Chardonnay and this and that, which they are actually allowed to do. But most things you read will say it's 100%, and all the growers I know are 100% Jacquer. Um, Beatrice Bernard took this over from her dad, René, uh, but he always ran the vineyards until very recently, and he's now in his <coughs> 80s, and he's sort of Beginning to step back, um, Beatrice learnt winemaking and does just a very traditional, simple winemaking. But this is the, um, her more intense apremont from Vievin, from old vines that were planted by her grandfather. So some of them are, most of them are over 60 years old. So that's a, a good age for a, for a vine. Um, as I say, Apremont is usually bottled, especially Apremont, bottled to sell right away. She bottles this later than her basic 
um, bottling and in fact there are only 15 in, in 2017 just to give you an example and this wine is imported here by Charles Neal selections and just to give you an example there are 1500 bottles of this produced annually I don't mean for the US market I mean total that's just an and this isn't considered a particularly tiny domain or anything um, it's small, seven, yeah. hectares. seven hectares. Yeah, but that's not that small for Savoir. They make up to 45,000 bottles. Okay, up to 45,000 bottles, but this, is, but this is one of the small cuvées, and this has been a long, long, long-term favorite of mine, so that's why I want it. Just, when I say favorite, I mean just to have in the fridge, just to open when friends come round, just to show, serve with charcuterie or cheese or anything, and just um, the, the sort of wine we need to start this tasting with. Yes, mountain dryness, isn't it? It just sort of gets the saliva going. Um, that's about all I'm going to say. Anyone else want to say anything? Any thoughts, any comments? It's straightforward, steely, stony, not alcoholic. This was probably chapterized, uh, enriched, just by half a percent, one percent. Jacquard, naturally, um, used to never go above nine percent. Um, with lower yields and with warmer, warmer, harv warmer summers and so on, now you increasingly see a natural level of 10 and, 10, 10 and a half. They usually bring it up to 11, 11 and a half. 2018, which is not this because this is 17, actually there were some people who were getting natural, uh, natural potential alcohol of 12% that is uh, a bit scary because we don't actually want Jacquet wines to be up there. I mean, they're, they're lovely at 11%, 11.5%. I keep forgetting to look at the bottles here, but I think this is marked, um, actually, it says so on the picture, 11.5%. And, and that is classic, but as I say, this would have been enriched by just a tiny bit. You don't taste it, but that's how it works there. Um, gorgeous, zippy acidity and just freshness, just nice to drink. Now, I haven't used that terrible F word yet, um, fondue. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that, actually. I must use that more often. Um, the pregnant pause probably needed to be a bit longer. Um, fondue, uh, <laughs> fondue, uh, you know, this is Apremont and fondue, obvious match. Uh, it's sort of a bit old hat and, and Savoir are desperately trying not to be labelled as wines for ski, you know, wines to drink for when you're skiing, wines to drink for fondue, because actually they're better than that. But having said that, you can have this with any of the che cooked cheese dishes, the raclette, the tartiflette, the fondue. But I mean, I actually prefer it with a plate of charcuterie. I think it's absolutely delicious with that. And it's good enough to go with, with a delicate fish dish. It can do, do all sorts of things. Um, OK, wine number two is something completely different. Arguably, it's the ubiqu uh, equally ubiquitous grape uh, but from the northern part of the area, Chasselas, which is like an everyday grape variety that nobody thinks very much of, but if any of you know Swiss wines, there are a few extraordinary and amazing Chasselas. Unfortunately in Haute Savoie, until recently, there have been very few extraordinary and amazing Chasselas, um, but Dominique Luca has come along to shake things up and I'm very, very impressed with what he's doing. Um, Dominique Luca was a bit of a lost soul. He was born um, in Burgundy uh, in a complicated family situation with a Burgundy domain, but he didn't really want to work there because of the family and also because of the neighbours who, in very intensely planted Burgundy, did not care about organics and he wanted to do organics. So he sort of left the f but kept an eye on the family de domain and kept sort of making some wines from there when he could but it was very tiny anyway and he sort of went off around France trying to find somewhere to lay his hat and he ended up in Savoie, in specifically Haute Savoie and specifically the delightfully named um, area of Crepy, um, known by most 
people as the area that produces crappy crappy and uh, and there are there is quite a bit of crappy crappy around unfortunately um, and he worked for oh god I won't go too far with this but he worked for the largest um, domain owner there and he learned about the area which was good he learned about working with Shasla and he helped this domain begin conversion to organics which then sort of came to a rather rude stop when he left and uh, a few years later and he set up his own domain by by leasing vineyards here that here and there in the area and he also got some land and started to plant things grapes that were not allowed in the Savoie Appellation, like uh, Chardonnay, well, no, Chardonnay is, but like Sauvignon Blanc, like Savignon from the Jura, and Pinot Gris, which is technically not uh, no longer allowed in the Appellation, but is allowed in IGP. And once he got to a certain stage, he thought, this is ridiculous, I'm going to just walk out of the Appellation, and I'm not going to label anything with AOC, that's why everything is IGP, and why he's not allowed to put Chasla on the label, he's not allowed to put any of the crew names on the label, so he has to sort of come up with fancy names. He makes, um, I think it's four or five different Chasla. Every single one is from a different area, every single one is aged in a different container. This is a guy who, everything is organic and biodynamic, although he's not certified biodynamic. Um, he's big mates with um, Dominique uh, Belois um, up the road, who I mentioned earlier, from IES. And he doesn't have any stainless steel in his cellar whatsoever. He doesn't have any plastic tanks in his cellar whatsoever. Everything is either oak or concrete, because he believes in oxidative um, aging in that way. Um, this particular cuvee is aged in demi mui which are the 500 barrel, 500 litre barrels, um, well, fermented and aged in. And Petit Coin de Paradis, a little corner of paradise, is what it means. Uh, it wasn't him who named this domain, Vin de Paradis. He took over a very, very small, tiny little family winery with a tiny bit of vineyard, and it already had the name because that was the name of the actual place um, within the, the little village of Balaison. It was called Paradis. Now this is an incredibly young wine. I would have loved to have shown you an older vi wine. It's, it's especially on the nose, not really expressing things yet. But having said that, Chasselin never gives really exuberant nose. It's, I think this wine is all about the texture on the palate. Texture is something we don't talk about enough in wine. I'm, I'm just waiting for somebody to write a book on it, not me. Um, and it's definitely not my sort of thing, but I'm sure somebody will um, and somebody should. So it may sound a bit strange if I say this, but this is definitely not a fondue wine. <laughs> Whereas most Chasla, that's sort of how they just say, ah, oh, yeah, Chasla, fine for fondue. You know, and it, it's a very dismissive statement, that's the problem. So this has obviously got a lot going for it, but I am, I'm, there's a spiciness from the oak, but it's all a bit disjointed at the moment. And I just, I would love it. I know it's not going to happen, but I would love it if this was just forgotten in everybody's cellar for two years, because I think that's what ought to happen, but I know, I know it won't. But um, this is the one that I forgot, because we actually decanted the reds today, but this is the one we should have decanted. <laughs> Too late, sorry, but just keep some in your glass and just uh, keep, keep tasting it. Um, okay, um, any questions so far about those two? Yeah. I didn't the grapes workhorse grapes is that okay I'm, I'm what these are both atypical the Chasselas definitely the Apremont no okay. no the Apremont is typical of a very good Apremont a very good Jacquet um, but the Chasselas is definitely atypical <laughs> So yeah, I mean, and we don't have prices here, but my suspicion is that wine two is maybe three times the price of wine one. Um, but 
uh, for various reasons we don't have prices, so it may only be twice as much, I don't know. Any, any ideas at either end of this table? The uh, Apromo is very underpriced, <laughs> says somebody up here, and I believe that. And I know Beatrice. And it's an interesting thing, this price. There's a real price division going on in, in Savoie at the moment. Um, growers, there are many growers, many vignerons who are very, very scared to increase prices. And, argue, and, and if they're going to go organic, they need to because they'll need extra labor and they'll have lower crops. And they're scared because their main market is France. And in many of the cases, their main market remains the ski resorts. And the restaurants in the ski resorts say, no, we're not paying above this. And if they just increase the price by, you know, a tiny little bit each year, they can get away with it, but make a big leap, they can't. So that's a so Beatrice would fall into that category. And then the other side, you get newcomers. So Dominic Lucas, a newcomer, he says, I'm working like this, I'm working biodynamically. There's no compromise, there's low yield, there's late picking, there's labor, there's this, there's that, the other. I don't give a monkeys about the French market. I'm gonna export everything and I'm gonna start here. Still grossly underpriced. Still grossly underpriced, I, I, I am under. I am uh, under instructions to say. <laughs> uh, 40% more. It's not double or yeah. Okay, 40% more? Oh, okay. Is that all? Okay, but on in if you were to buy there, if you were to buy there, well, it would be 100% more certainly. If you would, you know, just to buy direct from the sellers just just, you know, because you lived in the area. Um, but on the other hand, you couldn't really buy Dominique's wines because he has so little to sell. So there we are. But that, that puts it, it, I think it's an interesting pairing because of that, because it just shows two very, very different sides of it. And actually, so does the next pair. So the next pair is showing the same grape with different ages and entirely different terroir. So Domaine des Ardoisières, for those of you that don't know it, you saw the picture, is a reclaimed hillside that was uh, planted from 1999. There had been vineyards there in the past, but it was left out of the Appalachian uh, area because uh, they never had a, any reputation. They'd almost died out by the time the Appalachian came along. The only vineyards were for uh, family use, you know, just a few vines here and there and people making wine. And Michel Grisard, who is a, a legendary, now retired wine producer of uh, Domaine Prieré Saint Christophe, um, uh, he was legendary because he made only Mondeurs and Altesse. Uh, he converted to organics very early and to biodynamics almost to me, well, at the same time as organics, the first in Savoie. And he dared to sell his wines at a high price and he went with his wines in a bag to Paris, selling to the restaurants there. And then also in Savoie, he was given various breaks. He's a talker and he, he's much braver than most producers. He's widely disliked by the producers in the area and did fa fantastic things for the region. And he uh, had his own domain in Appalachian Controle, uh, but he knew this hillside. Uh, he had been to college just opposite it, and he'd always walked there. He's a great hiker, and he just kept thinking, I think there should be vines there. And with uh, the village that, that was, uh, with the villagers, they sort of formed an association and managed to buy land from 300 different landowners, buy and lease land uh, over a period of years and, and create this association to create Domaine des Ardoisières. And he wanted to do it all in biodynamics and everything. He took on a young vigneron to help him after a few years, who's called Brice Aumont. And um, after a few years, they saw things differently. So Michel knew that he had to step back and um, Brice runs it now. It's no longer in pure biodynamics, but it's definitely in organics. And also, if you're confused on the market, um, Domaine des Ardoisières is no longer only in this one place, this one hillside, which is above a village called Sevin, where three um, 
There are just three blend, uh, wines that come from there. There is Schist, which is a Jacquer blend. There is um, Quartz, which is this one, which is pure Altesse. And there is uh, Amethyst, which is a red blend. He then has a cheaper level, which is from other vineyards that have been rescued and so on, and not all of them are yet certified organic, but they're coming. And they're very, very good value, whereas the, these are very expensive. Um, Martin's wines were very generous because they knew I was coming. And they let us have uh, some magnums of this quartz because I was desperate to find a really, really good Altesse to show you as a contrast to a very different Altesse from Maritel. So here we are actually in the Alps rather than the pre-Alps. So that's why it's on a schist, micro schist and sandstone soil. Uh, beautiful exposure, 60% uh, slope on terraces and all trained like I showed you on that Sewer Eschler, very, very, very labor intensive vineyard. So that is this one. And I just before we talk about the taste, I'll just tell you about the other one, which is from the Roussette de Savoie crew of Maritel. There is an S in the middle, but they don't pronounce it Maritel, which is above Jean Gieu, which is above the Rhone Valley. A very warm, gorgeous hillside as well, exclusively planted with Altesse um, and making wines very much to age as well. Uh, one of the famous producers is Dupasquier. I wanted a Dupasquier wine, but we didn't have, there wasn't enough um, volume for our two tastings, so we couldn't do that. Um, so we have another producer called Eugène Carrel, who's one of the bigger exporters to the US. And uh, this isn't available in California directly, I don't think, but we got it for you anyway to show a Maratel with a bit of age. Um, because it's 2015, which was, uh, no, it's not, it's 16, sorry, but at least it's a year older, um, and two very, very different terroirs. So you'll find these extremely contrasting wines. Sorry? The soil for the second one is the classic um, uh, limestone scree, but it's actually Jurassic limestone because this is at the, foot, the southern extremities of the Jura Mountains. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually consistently warmer and a much earlier harvest because it is, is above the Rhone, which has an effect as well. And there's usually um, a little bit of Botrytis and Noble Rot that you might be noticing in there. So the first one was oak fermented in a mixture of, of um, small barrels and, and demi mui uh, and indigenous yeast and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second one was not. Uh, the second one was tank fermented and uh, everything is about, about showing the fruit. Um, both of them will age supremely well and entirely different food matches for both of them. And I don't think it's rocket science to guess which one is sort of double the price of the other. Um, but they are both very good wines. Um, so yes, uh, Domaine des Ardoisières is one of the most, uh, uh, when it is at this, when it is these um, special ones from Savin, uh, is one of the most expensive Savoir wines available and does not even have Savoir on the label because it is IGP Van des Alabruges. <laughs> so how complicated can one tiny region B. Um, I suggest that gradually we, you think about um, emptying glasses and uh, I might, I don't think, um, forgive me walking away, but I'm just going to, uh, hello, sliding door, just sort of say that soon we'll be ready to pour the next one. So um, I didn't see you in the back there, so you were hiding. Um, so I think gradually we can pour the next wines. If you have any questions on those or on anything else, we're going to try one more white wine, which will be a Bergeron, and then we're moving to reds. So if you wish to um, ask me anything, now is a great time to do so. Yeah. So Chasse sauce is mainly southeast. southeast. 
of um, Lake Geneva, right? Yes. That's, that's kind of the, yeah. the sweet spot for it. And, and you know, Switzerland is not that far away, right? Well, on the other right. side, yeah. But, and, and Switzerland is really the only place in the world where Shasta is going Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat the question just to keep everybody's attention. So what is the question? Well, the question is... Um, <laughs> Well, Why? Because I'm unfamiliar. No, so Chasselas hasn't taken on um, the Swiss. Chasselas, the question's about Chasselas and yeah. perhaps why, and why it isn't hasn't. greater planted. Chasselas is considered to be one of the most inferior grapes in, in France. Um, in Switzerland, it would have been grown as a workhorse grape as well. All, um, and just meaning a workhorse grape, meaning one that produces volume and consistently and doesn't have too much disease. So that's why it's never taken off. It's mainly an eating grape. It's absolutely delicious to eat, but there are all sorts of different varieties um, of Chasselas. Switzerland is the only place in the world that really achieves the Appetit Star. Well, and now here, and also, or, and also um, in um, Puy Fume, where it's called um, Puy, uh, it's just called Puy sur Loire when it's Chasselas. But I mean, like one or two producers. Everyone pour wine one now, so that the white is in glass. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want us to pause on the, the reds, or do you just get all the reds? In the glass? Well, I, I would get them in the glass, but just do white one first, so that they've got it, so we can. Yeah, super. Thanks. Yeah. So I have a. Do you think the? I'm gonna kill the pronunciation. The Jacare. 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 Yeah. So that's the most. Planted. Yeah. Yeah. Is the Altesse going up? Yes, yeah. but, but slowly. Slow. Things can't change very quickly. It's yeah. a very, it's more disease prone. Oh, okay. It's more difficult. There's always a reason for these things. I know. Yeah, this is good. The first but, but, is good, but, like but you can't, you, you can't commercially just produce amazing right. wine. You have to produce volume wine yeah. that you can bottle sooner, sell quicker, right. give you turnover. You there? Well, okay. Michel Grisai was just talking about he did things otherwise in a different way, but not everybody can do that. Not everybody can go right. at that level because we need wine at this level to drink, yeah. and our test is more difficult. So, yeah. Uh, okay. They're, they're fabulous. I mean, I really. They're so different, and there's tons of in between as well. You know, we could have just had eight wines of Altes. Uh, although I'm finding them really difficult to find over here, but we could have had eight different Altes styles. I think it's a style that isn't nearly, nearly prevalent enough. And uh, everybody tells me it's difficult to sell here. And, and I mean... The first time I ever saw your Jira book was at Lou's Wine Shop. I yeah, I'm there. going there on Thursday. I figured you might stop by yeah. town. No, I'm going there. I still don't know what wines he's going to do. It's yeah. great. I mean, I'm sure they'll be different, so come along if you can. I stuff like this, like the... Uh, Bruce said this is why he's like that's the first time I ever saw the, that type of bottling so it's usually with blue. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know what he. I keep saying, what wines are we having? What? I think these were going to do Jura and Savoie. Yeah. Uh, it's only fifteen dollars to get in. Come, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm sorry. I don't like Ripard. I no, think they're fine. doing a terrible job. I, I had to really fudge it in the book. I had to really... I, I know, but I just don't think it's good enough. It could be way better, and, but there we are. Um, it was 20 years ago, it was one of my go-to wines. 20 years ago, but it hasn't moved from 20 years ago. That's the point. And, 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 and it needs to. I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you, yeah. did you receive this round? No, okay. I haven't. I have a bucket right here for yeah, you Thank you. Like you. Yeah, I would. And I will pour. I'm just going. I'm just going to have a sip of this again. Okay, I can bring you another glass if you want no. to hold on to that. No, no, no. I'm just being. And this one's good to go. Yeah. Mm.
Yes. You are great. I just want to say. Thank you. Oh, I'm thank Taylor. You. I work with John. Hello, I'm, Taylor. I'll see you soon. Tonight. I'm for dinner tonight. Oh, great. I'll be eating with you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I know. Can you all hear me back here? All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Okay. How are you doing? I just met Taylor. Oh, shoot. <laughs> so what's up? Same here, my buddy. Your buddy? Hi. Apparently, loose, <laughs> loose friends, I would say. Loose. Yeah, he's more of my friend than I am his friend. Oh. <laughs> I better talk to my videographer. I started wandering around. Sorry. Oh no, you're good. Good. Yeah, just be, be mindful though. Like, it's still recording us out. So. Say that again. No, just be mindful. It is recording your audio still. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> but are, is it comfortable? Or? Yeah, totally. Okay. Totally. It's the best thing about these trousers, pants. Yeah, it's gonna be great. We're the second floor. Okay, has everybody got the white wine now? Because I think we should move on. And while, while the guys are pouring the reds, I'm going to talk a little bit about the white wine. So wine number five, the Chignon Bergeron. So first rule to know is never talk about Domaine Kenner. Why never talk about Domaine Kenner? Because there's tons of them. I think it's page 202 on my book, I actually say all the different Kenars. It's a bit like all the different Tissots in Jura. If you don't have my Jura book, why not? <laughs> and by the way, you can buy a special deal of the two together. I have very few Jura wine books with me, but I have some special deal later. Look, somebody's excited. <laughs> $30 for just the blue one, $55 for the blue and the yellow one. Uh, both personally signed with different, or different nonsense statements. So, um, back to the Kenars. The, there are many of them and there's at least two in the California market. Um, which makes things very confusing. So this one is from Domaine André Michel Kenard. And uh, for the record, the other one available uh, is Domaine Jean-François Kenard. So this is imported by Kermit Lynch and was one of the very first Savoir wine producers available in the US. And uh, Domaine Jean-François Kenard is imported by Charles Neal Selections. I actually know both of these domains really, really well. They're different, they're not related, and they're both really good. And I'm not just saying that to be politic today, um, they are. And so André Michel Kenard is, is a bit of a historic domain. Um, André is still with us, age about 92 or something, and was using the tractor until he was um, 89, only between 6 and 10 in the morning in the summer because it gets too hot afterwards. And um, I just... I, I, I did this story yesterday, but I want to do it again. So I said it was just between the four walls there, but now it's just between these four walls as well. Um, but I heard a story about these guys, and it really indicates the generations. So you've got André Kenard. He was an absolute pioneer. He, um, he was one of the founders, one of the people who pushed for the Appalachian Contrôlé, which was to, to come in. They knew they were getting the Winter Olympics in, in Albertville, so they wanted to have the wines as Appalachian Contrôlé by that time. Uh, he pushed also to grow Roussanne, uh, or Bergeron, as they call it there. Um, in Chignan, it was already there, but in tiny quantities, and he was mainly Jacquard, and he said, no, we need this to have a better quality white and all the rest. He did tons and tons of things for the region. He, he in his day, was just, just a real star. Then his son, Michel, who is currently early 60s, is currently the president of the local growers association. He's done masses for improving the Appalachian Contrôlé, for doing this, for doing that. And at the same time, he's built up his domain to a, a sizable domain. I can't remember, but 25 or 30 hectares and always with a decent, uh, decent level of quality. Um, they are not organic. They, they have been whatever sustainable means for some years. 
uh, they're not organic. So suns come along, and it was two suns, but one of them has gone off in a huff, I think. So it's the elder son, Guillaume, who is destined to take over this. So the younger son is there, age 30-ish, um, and uh, he, whereas Andre was sort of more or less self-educated, Michel went to bone wine school, and now son Guillaume has, after Bone, gone to do an enology degree in Changin in Switzerland because they got the money now to send him there. So this sort of tells you how generations change. Um, but he's very interested in the winery, but he's also interested in um, getting rid of weed killing. So he and his younger brother decided personally to restore an old um, harrow, an old plough, which you can, one of these ones you can attach, it's called a troy in French, that you can attach to a pulley and a tractor, and so you can weed kill the very steep slopes that are very, very stony that they have in Chignan with this. So the story I heard, not from the family, but from somebody else, <laughs> which is the one you are not supposed to share, and yet God, it's going on video. Oh dear. Um, but I, I'll say it very quickly so none of the French people can understand it who are, who are watching this. But apparently, especially not the André Michel Kenard, so don't tell them. So apparently, what would happen is that a few year, years ago, when the boys were first using this tray and they would do the, they would take it up and down these steep slopes, get rid of all the weeds, and Grandfather André would look at it and he would go, hmm. I don't trust this. And he would get on the tractor and spray some herbicide just in case the weeds came back. And that is the generational difference. And my, I just have this gut feeling that one day when it's his time to go, that gradually this domain might turn organic. You know, but they wouldn't dream of doing it while he was around. It would break him because he's the one who said that, you know, chemicals saved the vineyard and that's how we could do it and, and, and tells you how hard the work was in those days and everything. Um, he's a wonderful man. There we are. This is, so the other story is that Michel, the middle generation, in the early, uh, in the late 80s, um, he was planting more and more of the Bergeron on these very steep stony slopes and they were really difficult to work and he thought it would be a good idea to have terraces. Now you would expect to see a lot of terraces in steep vineyard, mountain vineyards but you don't because terraces are very difficult to create in the beginning and you don't, can't have so many vines per acre or vines per hectare so they are actually commercially difficult and, and uh, you're not going to get much volume but he thought we could do a higher, he could do a higher quality wine if he could have these terraces but how to do them and then he had an idea because of the Winter Olympics they were building a better road infrastructure down in the valley and he noticed there were, uh, they had just reached the bit directly below the vineyards and there was all this heavy machinery building a new freeway. So he went to chat with them and said, hi guys, you know, how about you come up the hill at the weekend and in the evenings and help me build these terraces? And the rest is history. So they <laughs> produce three uh, main cuvées of Chignan Bergeron, a, a, a standard one, then this one, which was only from the terraces, um, so both the standard one and this one are fermented and aged in, in steel. And then there's another one called Le Grand Rebesson, which is from an individual, um, uh, an individual vineyard, which, by the way, I tasted the other day because I went, I did a little thing with the staff at Kermit Lynch and was tasting really, really good, a 15 a Le Grand Rebesson. Um, and I don't usually like the oak-aged ones, so that was quite interesting, but this is not oak-aged. Um, and but is from these terraces. Long story, um, when I first started really knowing Savoir wines 20 odd years ago, it was always Bergeron that was considered, everybody said to me, this is the best Savoir wine, you want a great Savoir wine, it need, you know, get Chignan Bergeron, this is the top. On the other hand, I remember being served in a ski, res ski resort uh, restaurant, having ordered Chignan, which is Jacquet, to go with fondue uh, B, 
being served Chignan Bergeron because the servers had no idea about the difference. And Chignan Bergeron is not the wine to have with fondue, I assure you. So, um, not because it's too good, but because it tastes awful. No, they haven't got a clue. Haven't, and even today, uh, just, I'm just talking about the regular, because we, we drink alcohol when we ski, unlike you Americans, you know. We like having a wine at lunchtime and skiing. Especially when there's a whiteout, I find it really helps. <laughs> okay, back to this wine. Um, it, it has this sort of glorious, to me, apricotty spiciness. And okay, I mean, I don't imagine the apricots, do I? Does anyone else get apricots? Because um, I have this inside knowledge that Bergeron is a type of apricot in the Rhone Valley. And, uh, and I think that that's sort of why it got its name. But that's not actually proven in history books. But to me, it's like apricot skins and, and, or apricot kernels. And I love the nose of it. But you have to be very careful with food matching with this wine. But if you find the right food, it can be glorious. And, It's not bone dry, they say it is, but it's not. Um, I don't know what the residual is, but um, it's probably up at four or five grams per litre um, to me. But it has what, what the Rhone Valley producers envy Savoir for is this acidity. Because in the Rhone Valley, you cannot get this natural acidity um, uh, to, to balance the exuberance of the Roussan, and you can here in Chignan. There are many, many, many different styles of producing Chignan Bergeron. Um, more and more they're being fermented in oak and there are a few very, very good ones, but they have to, it has to be very, very good fruit to begin with. So there, you know, there's, there's the two, there's the unoaked, the oaked, and uh, it is a very good wine. Personally, I still stay with Altesse as being the finest variety and the one that will age for longest. But on the other hand, you can have this, 10 year old of this, no problem. Nearly all Savoir wines are drunk too young. Any thoughts, questions, or we will move to the reds? Yeah. Specifically with the Roussan uh, here, what effect has, have you seen the effect in the past, say, five, 10 years on the quality and how that's expressing itself? There's been a huge effect, which is uh, increasing alcohol. It's getting too high, and they're very worried about it. You know, you can only pick that so much early. They're, they don't have a tradition of adding acidity, but, but some of them will be now. Um, some of the bigger companies, uh, the enologists will s suggest they do that. You've got a sort of perfect storm that you have steep slopes, rocky, rocky soils that, that absorb the heat, Roussan that is naturally quite rich in sugar and then uh, warmer and warmer summers. It's a real issue, a real problem. So one of the ways to combat it, thanks for asking this, is, is uh, simply that if you were using malolactic fermentation, which never was the tradition. The whole thing about malolactic in whites is a bit weird. There was never a tradition for you of having malolactic. Then they started bringing it into not necessarily Jacquet, but some of them the old vine versions sometimes. Um, but definitely with Bergeron, with Altesse, they started bringing in more and more mallow or encouraging it and to, to soften the acidity that everybody was complaining about. And now we're having the other way around. So Guillaume, uh, the younger generation here, is saying that. There is still some mallow in this, but less and less and less. So that, that there have been big, big changes with that. It still can be glorious. Um, one producer to look out for is Gilles Berlioz, if you don't know him. Um, that they're a really, really glorious producer. I've just heard that I'm going to be in New York next week, and I'm going to be doing a dinner with Pas I'm just name dropping here with Pascaline Le Peltier at Racine, and we're going to have a Chignan Bergeron. Uh, Les Filles from uh, With a Bit of Age as well. And I think we'll probably put it with the cheese. Um, so I think Bergeron and cheese works very, very well with strong cheeses. Um, and obviously, we haven't talked about cheese yet, but all the whites. 
and cheese, meaning when I say cheese, I mean not cooked cheese, <laughs> proper cheese, uh, of which uh, we have a huge, wonderful selection from Savoie. Uh, even French people tend to say Savoie has the very best cheeses in the country, so I'm very proud of that. My own home in the mountains is in the Pays du Reblochon, so in the heart of Reblochon country. So how lucky am I? I can walk down the road, I can buy a whole Reblochon for six euros fifty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, sorry, sorry. <laughs> come, come visit, but Brexit is going to stop me being there much if the, unless we can stop it. So anything you can do to stop Brexit, I'd appreciate it. Um, so, uh, okay, the reds. Now, reds are difficult in Savoir. Um, they make sense when you're sitting down with a meal. They're really, really hard sometimes without. Um, the first wine is uh, Autremont, which was a, uh, I mean, they would never think of it as a brand, but um, it's a name that was created for this particular blend and vineyard by a legendary producer now retired called Jacques Maillet. Uh, a real character who had been in the local cooperative but had start, come to wine late and uh, he wanted to turn organic, nothing worked with the cooperative. He also wanted to make wines with no sulphur and he's a real maverick and uh, especially for his area which is Chotin. And I have always found his wines hit and miss. When they're good, they're absolutely fabulous. But it has to be the right day in the lunar cycle. And he will say that, you know? And I was, I was far too scared, even if we could have got one, I would have been too scared to present Jacques' wines at these seminars because they're, to me they're scary and I adore the man. I went and had lunch with him and his wife the other day to give him a book. But I, and I had a glorious wine there, but you, it has to be the right day and so on. He's very extreme or was very extreme. Um, and, but he was way above everybody else in the Chotan area. The Chotan area is above the Rhone and it has this special sandstone complicated um, soil called molass, which if you, cha if you translate it directly into English, geologists tell me is not the same. Molassic soil is not the same as molass in French, so it's a real problem. But this soil is much better for red varieties than for white varieties, and they have a long tradition of growing Gamay there and some Pinot and Mondeuse. Hence this blend, which is 50% Gamay, and 40% Pinot, 10% Mondeuse. It varies from year to year, but always a minimum of 50% of Gamay. And Jacques' vineyards were taken over by a young couple, um, Florian and Marie. Marie had worked for Gilles Berlioz, Florian, both of them are real court committed biodynamicists. Gosh, that word's difficult. And uh, they are committed to it so much. Uh, they, Jacques was already working biodynamically, but he hadn't sought certification. They now have Demeter certification, probably not for the 17, but they, they do from later vintages. Um, they do use a minuscule amount of SO2. Um, this wine uh, was whole grape maceration for four to five weeks with no pump overs or punch downs, so the cap would have been held in a, in a fixed grill um, just to keep the cap wet. And uh, then it would, uh, I think it was, um, I don't think it went into barrel. I think it was just matured in, in neutral tanks. They're working more and more with concrete, but they hadn't quite got it together for 17. So everything is changing with this domain. And I think they're doing a very good job. The wine was decanted and boy, it's better on the nose than it was earlier on. Whoa, I'm, uh, yesterday we didn't decant it and the first time I really could appreciate it is when I went, hey, I'm going to pour myself a glass after the seminar was finished and oh, there it was, it was delicious. But it hadn't been during the seminar um, because it's so reductive because as you may know that if you want to work with very low sulphur levels or no sulphur, you need to work in the absence of air as much as possible as well as being as clean as possible. So um, that is why. 
It has this glorious nose now of really intense mixtures. You can almost smell those three varieties there. So arguably the, the Gamay is given this, giving this sort of exuberant free, fruit. The Pinot Noir is giving a bit of depth and richness to it. And the Mondeuse is giving a touch of spiciness and, and the grippy tannins. I mean that, you know, you know these things, you can, I can trot those off on the tongue and that won't be exact, but it's, it's just a, I, I think it's tasting very, very good at the moment, but it'll age too. Um, we served it quite cool and I think it needs that. Um, it could be, uh, you could get away with a couple of degrees warmer than this, but not too warm. Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. good. The last two wines I, are Mondeurs. I just want you to know they are Mondeurs, okay? <laughs> the other day I had the pleasure of, uh, I only had really two days of visits in California, but I chose to investigate my speciality areas, grapes growing in California. So I went to Arnott Roberts, who I've known about for a long time. I've known their trousseau for a long time. And they very kindly invited um, uh, Scott from Jolly Laid, uh, Pax from Pax Merley, is that how it's pronounced? I don't know, or oh, Pax Merl and Jamie Motley, up and coming uh, California Mondeuse producer. And they just sort of, they all had a ball. I was a bit jet lagged, but I had a, we had a big table of wines and so on. And I don't know, has, have any of you met Pax? Oh, right, okay, well I hadn't. And um, <laughs> I, I'm not really scared of any, anybody, not even John here, but um, you know, I, I never even crossed my mind and I was, I was dipping in and out of the tasting. I, there were too many wines, but I'd done the Trousseaus and I'd done the whites, done the Trousseaus and then I said, I'm going to skip these and go to the Mondos. And uh, so Pax is why it had wine, a wine, and I think it was, was, well, it was not released yet. It just had an, you know, a white, white little ticket on it. And so Pax says, and here is my Mondos. And I looked at him and I said, no it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me daggers. And, and fortunately somebody held up a camera at the time, which I didn't know until afterwards. And then he went, this is my Mondoos. <laughs> and I went, no it isn't, it's your Mondeurs. And at that point, just everybody fell about laughing, which was, was <laughs> and it was only afterwards I realized, I discovered that nobody argues with Pax, apparently, but I discovered this afterwards, and uh, I think he forgave me, but, um, <laughs> so my mission, I realized at that moment, that my mission for my month in the US <laughs> is to teach all of you Americans to pronounce mon -deurs. okay? So, Mondeurs from Alban. Okay, so it is Mondeurs. Um, so, we have two, both from Alban, two years different, one from a, a very young and new domain, and one from a very old and traditional domain. Although, weirdly, they're actually made in the same way and from more or less the same area, and uh, both of them almost certainly from fairly old vines and there's even a family connection because Céline Jacquet is married to somebody who is related to the Trosset family which is in the last wine. Now the guy she's married, she, came, she wasn't from Savoie, she was from elsewhere, I can't remember, Vaucluse I think, and, uh, but with sort of links to the winemaking and she met her husband-to-be at wine college and he is part of the local wine cooperative and he's contracted to them so he can't get out of there but they farm the vines together so he has some grapes that he takes to the cooperative uh, very very specifically designated areas it has to be like that and she has the the grapes that she um, makes into her domain wines and he will join together with her I believe in in a couple of years so uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens then it'll mean a bigger domain so she's just sort of beginning and, and getting known and, and it was interesting to see this wine 
available in California uh, from Veritas, I think, and um, I wasn't aware that she was exporting, which is why there isn't a profile in the book. But um, there are a couple of lines about her as an up-and-coming up and coming producer. So she's done this uh, whole great. Now, the, you're, you'll find in my book there is a bit of Shakespeare, or rather butchered Shakespeare, which is to mondeurs to distem or not to distem, that is the question. And the whole story of it is that Originally, nobody destemmed Mondeurs because nobody destemmed anything because there weren't destemming machines. But Mondeurs in the old days, it's a very high cropper, it's very low alcohol naturally. So, if you can imagine pre climate change, pre understanding viticulture, you would get grapes with a potential of 9% and really unripe stems at the end of October. And uh, they were making, and so Mondeurs had a terrible, terrible reputation in Savoie for a long time. And then when the stemmers came along, and when they understood that they needed to drop fruit because it was such a high yielding grape, as is Syrah, so it shares that with Syrah, that they had to, to reduce those yields and work on green harvest and work on this and that, gradually the level of quality got up, went up, and the only producer that stood their ground with not distemming was in fact the last one that we've got, um, the Fils de Charles Trossé, so Charles Trossé is long gone, and his sons I'll tell you about in a minute. So now it's coming full circle, now we have warmer summers, we have better understanding of, 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 of what to do in the vineyard and so on, and they're now going back to whole bunch pressing. So um, it's all in flux and it's all in change and, and it does depend on the harvest. Some people will do half and half, some people will just, just you know, see how it is in the year, it does depend. So this one um, from Céline Jacquet was, was whole bunch. And as you've probably tasted, no oak, no oak at all. There, were, there was no tradition for oak aging. I mean, obviously, decades before there would have been oak aging because it was a convenient vessel. But um, once they had other vessels, concrete, plastic, whatever, no oak anywhere near um, Mondeurs. And as far as I know, the first person to age Mondeurs in oak was when Michel Grisard started doing it in the late 80s. And he used very, very good oak barrels, Bordeaux style, etc. Not new, but, um, but you know, secondhand from Bordeaux. And then other people followed, but even today, they drive me mad. I want to go and shake some of these producers. You go and they say, OK, so we've, we've introduced an oak cuvee of Mondeurs. Great. So I say, is this a special vineyard selection? Oh no, we're just using the same wine and putting it in oak. Okay, what's the point of that? Um, they have a lot to learn, you know, it, it's coming, it's coming. And obviously the wines that you see here are people who understand and get it better. But um, it's going to take its time. So um, I love Mondos without oak. But I also know that the very, very best, there are some very good oak cuvées. And uh, it was a shame we didn't get one for today, but it was juggling what we had available and, and so on. So um, I would say Céline's is more of the easy drinking um, Mondeuse style. Um, whereas when you try Les Fils de Chartrosse, this, okay, so Charles Trosse is a legendary producer I never met, um, not because he divide, died before I could have met him, but because his wife stopped me visiting, um, which is what happened with several old producers. I would phone up and i say, you know, in French, um, I'm, I'm a, I had to say, je suis journaliste, because you have to be categorized in France, and they wouldn't have understood anything else. Uh, so I had to say I'm a journalist and, and, oh, who do you work for? Oh, well, I'm working for a, an annual guide. And uh, they said, well, we're not interested in being an annual guide. Goodbye. We don't want your visit. And, and, and so all they would say, oh, we haven't got any money to pay to go in a annual guide. Uh, you don't have to pay. Goodbye. Um, and I mean, I, I struggled. This happened in Jura as well. I struggled to get visits sometimes. Really, really, really hard. Um, they, 
they lived and sometimes do live in another world. So I never visited Charles Trosse, but his sons um, never ever worked full time as vignerons. Um, and uh, they're now in their 70s. Uh, Joseph has retired and um, Louis is still around with two hectares and um, he uh, is now retired from being a full-time teacher and Confessions of Wink, I've never even visited him because it's even difficult to visit him but I have met him um, and I decided not to do a profile because they drove me mad really um, and so I wrote a few things about them in the book particularly because they were legendary they are the darlings of the French wine press and, um, and I have enjoyed their wines often in restaurants so it's as simple as that and so it's about enjoyment so there used to be just one Mondeurs from them and, and then gradually the sons started doing cuvées, the sons being the ones in their 70s. So this is the sort of mid-level cuvée, Harmonie, from older vines, from two different parcels. It's not organic but they're very, very um, sustainable. Um, and uh, you'll see it's from a very warm vintage, 15, um, and also would be a whole bunch and no oak. The nose I cannot get friendly with at all, but when I taste it, there's a whole different thing. And I think once I learned to stop smelling his wines, then I began to like them more. Mm. Mm. This has been decanted, hasn't changed the nose one bit, but it has changed the palate. And boy, there's this gorgeous sort of inky and slightly metallic character to it, but in a good way, and spice and the tannins have softened. And I think just sitting down with food, but what food would be the great thing? So I will just, before I finish, tell you that the a very old fashioned, not old fashioned, just very traditional rustic pairing would be Joe sausage, sausages. And Joe is spelt D-I-O-T-S, as most of my British friends would call them, Diots, um, uh, but pronounced Joe. And they're a very dense pork sausage that you traditionally uh, lit. Well, it's one. I'm not, I'm not a. I, I can't cook, but I do. I do, but I've been lucky enough, um, and I to mainly have people to cook for me. But I can cook Joe. You know what you do. You go and get a, well this is what I do, you get a bottle of white wine that you don't want to drink but is dry preferably and okay and you open it, I can do that, and you take a big saucepan and you put that saucepan on the stove, I can do that, and you upend the whole bottle into the saucepan. You then take the sausages and you put them in there and you put a lid on it and then you put the heat on and 40 minutes later, they're ready. <laughs> I can do that. And all the fat comes out into the wine. Um, and the traditional way of serving it is this, this wonderful Savoir diet food, which is um, polenta, <laughs> polant. And polenta is traditional Savoyard dish. Yes, you thought it was Italian. Remember, Northwest Italy was part of the Duchy of Savoy, or Savoir. It's a traditional Savoir grain that was grown on what we now know the Italian side in the plains. So you do this special, special um, diet dish of um, you make the polenta and you mix in a large lump of butter, huge pot of cream and you grate uh, Beaufort cheese into it. Okay. <laughs> Never a green vegetable, and that's what you serve with uh, with the uh, <laughs> with the Joe, and you drink a good Mondeuse with, with it. So there's my wine and food pairing trip for the day, and I think there's food to come, and there are books to sell and sign. So thanks for your attention. And now we've come to Lynn's favorite portion of the day, which is the sale of her books. <laughs> and, but, but, I, but I do want to say, and I don't think, Ashley, you knew this, but we, we have flown in three cheeses from Savoie. They're fresh cheeses. We have some Abondance, some Robuchon, and some Beaufort. And, and Chef Tetsu has made some Joe. 
Superb. I heard rumors, but I had forgotten about it until I started to dig it. Yeah. Great. Thanks, John.